Okay, great. So let's dive into today's topic. So um, we are going to be talking about uh, IP. We're going to be talking about addressing, and we're going to be talking about naming. Again, one of the distinctions between 123 and 124 is we're going to, in this class, we're going to be talking about um, the interface, the, the, the sort of interface to these concepts rather than how they're implemented in the wide area. So if you are interested in kind of how the underpinnings of how all this stuff works, definitely check out 123. Okay, just as a review, uh, an internetwork or the internet is an arbitrary collection of, of networks that are designed to provide some kind of a packet delivery service. So the idea is we're going to interconnect different networks, and we're going to pass data from one network to the other to get it to the ultimate destination. And the internetwork protocol is the thing that makes all of this work. So if we look at a, a diagram like this that's taken from the um, Peterson and Davey book, what we actually see is that we've got a host here on the left, a host on the right. Host is another word for server or computer. And we have sort of three networks in between. And there's some routers along the path um, between the, the two hosts. And one of the things that you'll see is this sort of layer design. So as we saw on the first day, um, the, each of these layers offers a, a service interface to the layer above it. So this TCP is going to be calling the service interface of IP, and IP is going to live on, in this case, a, uh, a wireless protocol. And at each layer here, we're going to be adding metadata. We're going to be adding headers to the, the data that is unique to that particular network. So when we call down into the TCP layer from the application, we're going to be passing it uninterpreted bytes. Just, here's a bunch of bytes. Send it to the destination. The TCP layer is going to take that data and um, put it and, and basically wrap that data with a TCP unique header that has state that is important for TCP to work. The TCP process is then going to call down into the IP layer and add another header. That's the IP header. And the IP header is going to tell the network how to get the data to the final destination. And the IP part is going to call down into the specific network technology that's going to have yet its own header to figure out how that exactly works. So as data kind of flows through the system, we're going to be adding and removing headers unique to those particular networks until it gets to the destination. And so um, the thing that kind of makes all this work is the fact that there's this single layer that every single network technology and every single end host has to implement for this to work, which is IP. So that's the sort of commonality that allows all these networks to work together. The evolution of that process is incredibly fascinating, but, but obviously beyond the scope of this class. So let's talk a little bit about addressing. So the internet itself has this very weak uh, service model, which is that it can deliver packets of data. A packet is just a fixed amount of bytes. It can vary between uh, just a couple to maybe a couple thousand. Uh, and the internet has no concept of, of a connection. So every packet is sent independently of every other packet. And as we mentioned before, packets can be lost, they can be delivered out of order, they can be duplicated, and all these other sort of erroneous type conditions can occur. Um, we're not going to have to worry about that for this particular class because we're going to be relying on the semantics that TCP provides to ensure that data gets to the destination without getting lost, in order, and no duplicates are there. So let's talk a little bit about addressing. So this on the right is a diagram representing the fields of an IP header, of an IP packet. And there's a lot of different fields here. Of interest to us is the source address and the destination address. As the packet flows through the, net through the network and as it goes from one network provider to another, those two fields are going to remain constant. So the source is the ultimate source of data and the destination is the ultimate destination. Towards around week eight or so of the course, we're going to talk a little bit about um, overlay networks, peer-to-peer -peer networks, and, and other types of network designs uh, where that, uh, that property won't hold, where the, the source and destination addresses represent the original source and destination. Okay. So what do these addresses look like? Well, they have to be globally unique. So if I want to send a packet to a server that's going to be in Seoul, Korea, it has to have a unique address. Otherwise, uh, there's no way to get it there. Um, and so... Um, it, these addresses are unique, they're hierarchical, meaning that given an address, I can actually figure out what network it belongs to, and I can send it towards that network. And it's up to that network to figure out how to actually deliver it to the final host. So it's not up to me, I just need to know where to send it to get it closer to that destination. And the um, IP addresses 
depending on which version of the IP protocol you use, are either 32 bits or 128 bits, but let's just say we're using uh, four byte IP addresses, meaning you can have about four billion hosts on the internet. Yeah. yeah. So the way that we kind of, uh, you've seen this I'm sure in different ways, we separate the four bytes that make up the IP address with these uh, dotted, so-called dotted quad notation, where you have four numbers between zero and 255 separated by periods. And originally, the network was designed into these classes. So you had a class A network and a class B network and a class C network. And what these classes did was that they told you how big, so I said that these networks, these, these addresses are hierarchical. And the hierarchy is basically a two-level hierarchy. What's the network? Some bits assigned to the network, and then within a network, you have bits that are assigned to the host. And the only thing the internet, the wide area internet routing protocol, which happens to be called BGP, the only thing it cares about is this first part, the network. It doesn't care about the host. So all it looks at is those first couple bits that relate to the network, and it figures out how to get it to that network. Once the packets get to the network, at that point, it's up to that network to figure out where all the different hosts are. So the way to think about that is that when you send data to UCSD from Stanford, the routers along the path just know to get it to UCSD. They have no knowledge where on campus that server or that destination is going to be, and it's the job of the routers on campus to know, ah, this laptop happens to be in this part of the campus, in this classroom, so I'm going to go ahead and route it to that destination. Now, there's kind of a problem with this structure. Uh, which is that it is not particularly um, very flexible. So this original design, you had these three network sizes. A network could either have 256 hosts or 65,000 hosts or 16 million hosts, and that was it. And, and you had to pick one or the other. So initially, IP addresses were really cheap, and so like MIT got 16 million and... Uh, there was like a ham radio group that got 16 million, whatever. And so now that uh, we're starting to run out of IP addresses, actually we ran out of IP addresses a while ago, there was a, a big, uh, re, you know, there's, there's a lot of um, motivation to want to be more fine-grained. In other words, I want to be able to give you, let's say, just 16 addresses, or I want to give this group 4,000, some variation between these, these, um, these kind of extremes. And so there is this technology called CIDR, which stands for Classless Interdomain Routing, which en enables you to basically build a network that's any power of two. So I could create a network that only has 16 hosts in it or 32 hosts in it. And now, see before, the size of the network was determined by the first couple bits. So if the first bit of the IP address was a zero, we knew that the network only had seven bits in it. If the first two bits were one zero, we knew that the network had 14 bits in it. So how do we indicate that now? Um, well now the number of bits assigned to a host is actually part of the address and it's indicated with a slash. So the reason I'm sort of going through this is because as part of the, the web server project, you're gonna be specifying um, IP addresses and there is this sort of slash notation that's used. So this is sort of very commonly used when you're in the networking world. And whenever you have the slash, what it basically tells you is how many of the first couple bits are used for the network. So in the first case, 16 bits are used for the network, and the last 16 bits are used for the hosts in the network. So this means that uh, this particular address, only the first 16 bits of this address refer to the network, and these have to do with, within that network, what that host is. In the second case, the first uh, 24 bits define the network, and, and the last eight define the host. And here, we've defined a network that actually only has four hosts in it. Okay. So, um, that's kind of a, how people specify addresses and address ranges these days. Now, the network size has to be a factor of two to, to use this, but that's kind of the idea. So anytime you do security, computer security, anything like that, where you're saying things like, okay, I wanna, I wanna firewall off this thing, or I wanna allow this network to access this resource, generally speaking, those firewall rules are going to be specified in this uh, slash notation. Okay, excellent. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how these addresses get assigned. So um, how many people here have heard of DHCP or seen that in some capacity? A couple. So generally speaking, um, originally you had to kind of register every time you plugged a computer into the, the wall or something like that. Um, you had to get uh, some administrator to assign address to you. Uh, that's extremely inconvenient, and so there's this protocol 
called DHCP that will assign an IP address to a host that enters the network. So whenever you join the network, like you open your laptop or your phone or something on campus, and you connect to the Wi-Fi, you need an IP address. It has to be globally unique. And so rather than having to ask someone for it, this protocol will actually assign that to you. And so these servers maintain a pool of addresses that they can give out to people who are on their network. And it looks a little bit like this. The details are, um, are, are a little bit um, beyond the scope of the course, but the idea is that we have a network here, and you have a host, and whenever the host joins the network, it is going to send a message to a special IP address. And that IP address is referred to as, as, as this, 255, 255, et cetera, and it's basically the all ones IP address. And that is a broadcast address, meaning I want everyone on the network to be able to hear this message. One of the nodes on the network that will hear it is one of these DHCP servers. And it will basically um, take that request and find one of its unused IP addresses. And then it sends a message back to that host with that address assignment. So once that exchange has completed, now the host has all the network information it needs in order to communicate on that network. So that's kind of where these addresses come from, and that's how they get assigned to, uh, to machines on the network. Okay. So we have now this handle, this, this number that can refer uniquely to every host on the network. And we have a way of sort of scalably assigning addresses to hosts. Um, but now how do we actually use these in real life? So it's very inconvenient to remember IP addresses. Most people don't. And so we want to use something a lot friendlier that's easier to remember. Yeah. Okay, so this is a great question. So the, the, the question was sort of, I said, well, the host is going to send this broadcast over here to this server, and the server is going to respond back with a, um, an assignment of an IP address. Now, it could broadcast that back to the host the same way. So we have the special broadcast address. Anyone who sends to it, everyone on the network will hear that. So it could send that broadcast back, and then the client could sort of see the response to its message. That's one way of doing it. Turns out that um, these DHCP servers are actually um, going to, I said that we have these layered protocol models. So we have TCP and then maybe we have IP. And then underneath that is something like, let's say, Ethernet. So they can actually, this server can actually send a message using that lower level protocol directly to the host. Uh, and then once it gets the message, it's now part of the IP network and it can send it at that higher level protocol. So there's a couple different ways you could do it. A little bit, it depends on the, on the network technology itself. There are some networks that allow you to send a message just to one other participant. And then there are some network technologies that require that you broadcast to everyone. So original Ethernet a long time ago, everyone on the network heard every message sent anywhere. And in a certain sense with Wi-Fi, it's kind of like that too. Like if I transmit a message to the Wi-Fi base station, anyone in this room can overhear that message. Mm -hmm. What does the, the acronym stand for? Um, dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. So it just means host is joining the network, it gets an IP, it gets this uh, address assigned to it. Okay. Yeah. And when you were saying anybody can, uh, if you relay a message to the Wi-Fi uh, router, then anybody can see it, is that how like a man in the middle trick works? So the question was about man in the middle. Um, I'm going to defer that question a little bit. Just it's just to say that um, some network technologies are just fundamentally a broadcast technology. Okay. Like there's no way to kind of send a message to one other person. You sort of have to send it to everyone. Um, okay. Now, for servers like www.ucsd.edu and Google.com and things like that, uh, they may or may not use this DHCP protocol to get their IP addresses, but um, but they are assigned by an administrator or using this protocol. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about using names, because like I said, we don't want to use IP addresses uh, in order to build network services. So what's, what's sort of the difference? Well, DNS, which stands for Domain Name System, uh, we can assign these sort of friendly addresses to uh, different hosts on the internet, like www.cs.ucsd.edu, something we can remember, like we can all remember facebook.com, for example, or twitter.com or something. Um, these names can be variable length. You have a total character. They don't even have to be US ASCII anymore. They can be Unicode in different character sets. 
but they don't really tell you anything about the location. Like if I just, in this case, you kind of look at it and you're like, well, San Diego, I guess, is sort of in California. But in general, if I just sent a message to, um, you know, uh, some company named IBM.com, there's no way to look at that and actually figure out where that, that goes. So we have to kind of do something about that. Now, an IP address on the other side, on the other hand, is understand by routers. It's a fixed length, and its hierarchical structure means that we can actually look at it and figure out where that network actually physically is in the network. So we have to have some way to bridge between these host names, which people like, and these IP addresses that computers like. Okay, so we're going to use DNS for that. So DNS is a service, it's a network service that's distributed around the world, and it does the translation between a host name and an IP address. So if I give it a host name, this service that is running will return back an IP address. And I can use that IP address to now actually send data. So I've now changed the process of sending data to some new destination into two steps. I first have to figure out what the IP address is. Once I've got that address, now I can actually open a connection to that, uh, to that destination. Okay, so it can do this in one direction. It can also do it in the other direction, uh, potentially. But it has some other purposes as well. And we'll see this when we start talking about content distribution networks a little bit later in the course. Um, it can alias different names to the same host. So, for example, www.cs.ucsd.edu is not actually the name of a server. It's just an alias. It's like a, a pseudonym for a computer called cscweb.ucsd.edu. Um, so you can sort of uh, have aliases there. It's also used uh, to implement the email system. So if I want to send email to, uh, you know, alan.turing at gmail.com, my mail client needs to be able to connect to Gmail's mail server. And in order to find out what the address of Gmail's web server is, the DNS system has been extended and augmented to allow every domain, every you know, company or organization to say, hey, this is the address of our mail server. So if you want to send mail to my domain, this is the address you need to use. Okay. Um, so it has all these different purposes. So before DNS, um, it's kind of fascinating. Back as, er, I mean, well, back in 1982 and before, there was no system like that. There was just a file. There was like one file called host, and it had a list of every host on the internet in it. And actually, there was this guy named Postal who worked at SRI. I think it was SRI. It was ISI. He's in California. I want to say he was in LA. And he would just update it. Like, you would send him an email and be like, hey, I have this new host. I'm over in MIT. And then he'd add it to the list. And so every night, they would download the list. This is what happened. So there's like one guy, every host that was on the internet, he put it in the computer. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, it was SRI in Menlo Park, that's right. So uh, that didn't scale too well, um, you know. So there's several reasons for that. Obviously, you can't have a human in the loop, but also kind of like, um, you know, it's this sort of single point of failure. There's this like one website or FTP site at the time, file transfer site that you would download stuff from. Every network in the internet would download this file at the same time every night. Uh, wasn't too convenient. So what we really needed was a distributed hierarchical collection of servers that would still implement that mapping functionality in a way that could scale to the entire world's population. Okay, so we have what is effectively a wide area distributed database, and it has to be scalable, uh, robust to attacks and things like that. Um, it has this global scope, and we have to be able to update things. Because if I take away the web server and I put a new machine in there, that maybe has a different IP address, I need to be able to take www.cs.ucsd.edu and point it to this new server. So I have to have some way to change this database. Now, and it has to be good performance, because every time you make a connection to anything, in some sense, you have to do a lookup in this distributed service. Okay, so that's a lot. Now, what don't we need? In a sense, con strong consistency was given up as a, as a thing. So, what this means, basically, and, and we're going to talk actually about replica consistency in the middle part of the course, but in general, building a system that could be global in scope, robust, scalable, and good performance, um, and also strongly consistent is too big of a challenge. So we just gave that up. So what I mean by that is that if, let's say at UCSD, we move a server to a different part of the network, and so its IP address changes, let's say. We're going to update this database this DNS system. And what's gonna happen is, 
it may take hours or a day or two for the entire world to see that change. So there may be a period of time after we've changed this mapping before everyone on the network sees that, that change. And that's what we mean when we say we're giving up strong consistency. We have this weak consistency model. We're gonna quantify how consistent replicas can be again in a couple weeks from now. Okay, so let's dive into DNS just a little bit here. So we have a hierarchical namespace divided into these sections called zones and zones are distributed across a collection of these servers. So this hierarchy of servers looks like the following. So we have a set of what are called root servers, and um, every uh, network in the world has to know the IP addresses of these root servers. Because if you think about what, I, what, what this service is, is okay, I wanna be able to look up a mapping of a, a domain name or a host name into an IP address, I'm gonna use DNS, but how do I connect to DNS? It's like sort of a recursive problem, right? So in order to break that dependency loop, you just have to know at least one IP address of some DNS server somewhere. And it turns out that there's a set of servers called root servers, and everyone just knows what those are. Then there's a set of what are called top-level domain or TLD servers, and then there's a set of what are called authoritative DNS servers. Okay. then. Those are kind of the hierarchy of servers, and then to do the translations, we have what are called local DNS servers that are kind of located near clients, and then we have some resolver software that actually runs on your, on your host that interacts with this whole system. So let's talk about these a little bit more. So here is an example of what we're talking about in action. So we have a root server up here at the top. You just know the address of that. Then we have some what are called top-level domains, and those are like .com, .gov, .edu. It's the last part of the, the domain name. And then within each of these TLDs, you have a bunch of organizations, Princeton, UCSD, whatever, FCC.gov, Google.com, things like that. And so the hierarchy of the namespace matches the hierarchy of the servers. So back to this, sort of the root servers we know about, the TLD servers are, are sort of here, and then the authoritative servers are like at UCSD, for example. Okay, we're gonna deal with those one by one. So these root servers, um, turns out there's 13 of them and this is where they are. So that's the list of them, that's where they are. The whole internet is based on that. If those 13 servers failed, the whole internet would basically fail. So is that a problem? <laughs> that seems bad, right? Like that's not good, I, I would think. So why doesn't the internet fail? Because these servers are under attack a lot, I will tell you. Well, the reason is sort of that um, it turns out that each server is actually really a cluster of servers, and some of them are actually geographically distributed. And there is this technology called Anycast, which basically means that like, if I happen to be here in Spain or Portugal, and I try to connect to a, a DNS root server, I am very likely going to hit one of these two ones right here. If I'm over here in uh, San Diego, I'm likely gonna hit one in LA or Marina del Rey, which is kind of also in LA. So they're sort of this, uh, even though they're logically, um, logically, they look like just a single root server. In fact, they're a cluster of machines that kind of implement a service that can be made fault tolerant. Okay, so um, we're gonna begin in a, in a few minutes, okay? Great, so if you remember where we left off, we were talking about how DNS provides this hierarchical um, namespace where we can identify machines with sort of easy to remember uh, names that follow some kind of a hierarchy. So for example, let me turn on my little pen here. So for example, we can identify the fact that there is maybe a machine called CS that's inside of the UCSD network that's part of the EDU top level domain that is part of the DNS system. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, there is sort of this bootstrapping problem where we have to figure out some way to actually get into this DNS network. Uh, and so there are these 13 servers, root servers, uh, that effectively you just have to know the IP address of one of these servers or all 13 of these servers in order to know how to begin traversing this DNS hierarchy in order to start doing this uh, use this name to IP address mapping. 
Uh, we talked a little bit about how, in fact, even though there's these 13 services, they're actually implemented in a fault-tolerant, available uh, way so that uh, we don't end up having the whole system collapse because of hackers or whatever else. Okay, so I mentioned that there are these top-level domains uh, that have to do with like edu.com and some country codes like .us, and then uh, underneath that we have different organizations, like UCSD is part of the edu top-level domain. Um, you know, Google is part of the .com top-level domain, and it would have its own authoritative DNS servers. Now, when we talk about, um, so there is this kind of top-down hierarchy where you have these root servers, then you have the TLD, then you have authoritative, kind of working top to bottom. Um, there are also co this concept of, of local name servers. So local name servers effectively live like in an ISP or a company or a university, uh, and um, it is responsible for basically um, interfacing with the DNS system on your behalf. So I mentioned on Friday about this, or maybe last Wednesday, about this DHCP protocol, this, the um, dynamic host configuration protocol, and I said, well, when you join the network, you issue this DHCP request, and it gives you back an IP address, and it does. But it also gives you back other information as well. And some of the other information it gives you back is the address or addresses of one or more DNS servers so that you know, your, your client knows how to actually issue those requests. So if you're at home and you have like a, your own base station, um, it will give you an address, and it will also give you the, either your ISPs, the, the you know, Comcast or Time Warner or whatever, the ISPs uh, DNS servers or some other kind of DNS server. Okay. And while these are, these are actually quite useful because um, effectively, instead of traversing that entire hierarchy on my, by myself, going to the root name server, working my way down, I can simply go to that local DNS server and say, hey, I'm looking for www.google.com. Do you happen to have it? And um, it is able to kind of proxy that and sort of handle that, um, do that work on behalf of the client. And of course, because a lot of, the, a lot of people go to the same addresses, um, it can cache those results and um, not have to do those lookups every time. Okay, so I mentioned that there are these, uh, what are called resource records. Uh, and they basically have this format where they have a name, they have a type, and a value. And then they have a time to live field, which we'll talk about in one second. So there are some different types. Uh, this A type maps names to addresses. So if I look up www.cs.ucsd.edu, the A record will contain the mapping from www to whatever the address is. Uh, there is a NS record that effectively lets you figure out what uh, DNS server is responsible for a given domain. Uh, there's something called a C name, which is, think of it like a symbolic link or something that is standing for something else. So we might have a friendly name like www um, that actually is going to map to some machine name like CSE Web 2 or something like that. So it's basically a way to kind of create a mapping of a, a fake name to a, to a real name. And then finally, each uh, domain can have what's called an MX record that allows sites, uh, clients that are outside of the network to figure out what the mail server address is for that domain. So let's look at it in, in operation. So uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about, DNA, uh, about what UDP is, but we mentioned it's basically this very lightweight protocol that lives right on top of the internet protocol. And there are these two ways of interacting with these DNS servers. Uh, there's this recursive way, and then there's this iterative way. So, in this recursive model, what the client is gonna do is it's gonna connect to a name server and say, hey, I'm looking for this. You know, I'm looking for www.cs.ucsd.edu, and that name server is either going to have that mapping in its cache, or it's gonna figure out how to get that mapping. So if it doesn't have that mapping, it can go off and um, traverse that hierarchical structure to get the answer, and then it returns it back to the client. Uh, the other way is this iterative way where basically it can say, well, you know, I don't know the answer, but here's someone who might have it. So there's these kind of two different approaches, and they have some advantages and disadvantages. But if we look at this recursive DNS in action, we can sort of see uh, what that might look like for this running example of the CS department web server, which is that the client basically connects to a local DNS proxy. So again, think about it, like you're at home, let's say, you have your um, airport base station thing, and it's running a DNS proxy on your behalf. 
So when you get an address at home, it says the, that it is the DNS server. So when you try to look up the CS web page, you're gonna send this query to your base station, and then it's gonna try to figure out what that address is. And if it doesn't have it in its mapping, what it might do is say, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and go to the edu name server. Let's say it, it knows that already. Um, and it says, hey, I'm looking for this address, cs.ucsd.edu, to the edu server. And the edu server says, okay, well, if you wanna look up this address, uh, you should go talk to UCSD, because they are the ones that have it. And it actually includes the IP address of UCSD's name server. Okay, good, so now the local client's like, okay, well, the local proxy's like, okay, let me go to UCSD's DNS server and try to look up CS. And it says, well, here's the address. Uh, it, the address is actually um, managed by the CS department, so it says, you know, the princess is in another castle, it's not right here, so it goes back to here. And then finally the client goes to the CS department's DNS server which says, ah, I actually have the real mapping. I know the, the real answer. So it returns back the IP address of the server which goes all the way back to the client. And now this proxy will also keep a copy of that mapping just in case it needs to be used in the near future. Now this um, sort of uh, recursive process is, some, is sort of useful because now the client doesn't have to to deal with all of, that, um, all of that work. So again, we have this kind of two options. We have this recursive option where it's sort of less burden on the, the original entity, but the name server has to do a little bit more work. Uh, and then we have this iterative version where basically uh, it sort of pulls some of the work off of the name server itself. It can just sort of send these referrals back to you and, it, and, it, and then it's up to you to, to do them. Yeah. Sure, so um, in a sense, actually, this picture sort of shows both the recursive and the iterative in action, actually. So from the point of view of the client, this request is recursive because it sort of goes to the local, the local DNS resolver and then it gets the answer back. So from its point of view, it's all up to this local DNS proxy to do all the work. So from its point of view, it's recursive. But think about it now if you're the local DNS proxy. When you went to this top level domain server, it didn't give you the answer actually. It simply said, well I don't have the answer but here's somewhere that's closer to the answer than I am. Then the client, I mean then the proxy had to do another request to UCSD and it said, well I don't have the answer but the CS department does. So then it had to go to the CS department and say, do you have the answer and they said yes. So that's where that iterative is coming from. Okay, so the question, if you didn't hear it, was does this local DNS proxy not belong to the hierarchy? I used that wording on a couple slides ago. It's not really part of this hierarchy in the sense that it's not, so these servers on the right are part of the hierarchy. We've got EDU, top level domain, then we have the authoritative domain server for UCSD, then we have an authoritative domain server for the CS department. In other words, that's actually part of the hierarchy this local DNS proxy is sort of just sitting on the side interacting with that hierarchy. And the reason why we have these local DNS proxies is just sort of for convenience because rather than having every device on the network have to kind of iterate across all of these different servers, it's often the case that say at UCSD, you know, we have a local DNS proxy. Like when you connect to the uh, access point, you get some addresses. I haven't verified this, but it's very likely that the DNS addresses that you get are for locally run UCSD addresses. And so it turns out that when you have like, I don't know, 30,000 students and 10,000 faculty and staff on, in one campus, we all go to a relatively small set of, you know, Facebook and Twitter and stuff like that. I mean, I know not, of course, during this hour, but you know, you, you're kind of going to all these different sites. And so it's, it's that, that proxy is able to cache that data across all of these users. Now this caching thing is actually really important because um, this DNS resolution process has to complete before I can even begin communicating. So we're gonna talk about sockets in a little bit and the point is, is that when we open a socket connection, meaning we're opening a network connection to a server on another machine, that initial step can't occur until we know 
the IP address of that server. And so if we're having to interact with this globally distributed uh, hierarchical DNS service, every single time we want to do an up, uh, a lookup, uh, that will add a lot of latency to our, our connection. Yeah. So you said the DNS proxy uh, caches data amongst users. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the question was, if the DNS proxy is caching requests, does that mean that one user's interactions with the internet could actually speed up someone else's? And the answer is yes. So in other words, if I look up, um, you know, let's say that we were doing an in-class exercise where I said, okay, we're all going to make connections to a web server that I set up on Amazon's cloud environment. Well, the first person who sort of their code tries to make that connection is going to trigger this DNS resolution process. But every single other person who, need, who needs to do that will be able to take advantage of the fact that the results have been cached along the way, and so they should be super, super quick. This also comes up a lot even for a single user because often when you request something from a web page, you're going to make many, many different requests in a very short period of time back to back. That first time, you're going to see a long DNS resolution latency. But then ideally, past that point, everything should go super fast because the mapping is actually cached. Okay, so this is sort of a, a, sort of a key aspect of, of how these things work. And there's a lot of work that goes on in terms of the web to try to um, lower the latency of doing these connections and these requests because of the fact that um, uh, for small web requests, the DNS uh, latency can actually be longer than the time it takes to download the data. And so that would kind of result in a, um, a bad user experience because every time uh, things are delayed, it, it kind of causes lag and makes the system slow. Okay. So how do we actually interact with this DNS system from an API point of view? So this is a set of, um, there, are set, there are a couple different ways that we can do this. Um, I am going to be showing you a very brief example from this book, uh, like I said, in the lecture, the lecture notes, the podcast, we're not going to have time to go over exactly all the details of how this stuff works. So it's really important to kind of take a look at the readings that I've assigned from this just because um, otherwise uh, it'll look very confusing. So this is um, a, a function that's talked about in the book uh, that is a sort of a standard uh, function for interacting with DNS. And it does several different things. And I just want to talk about it in brief to show you kind of what it's, what's going on here. So again, um, there are several different arguments to this uh, get adder info command. Uh, and the most important are really these first two. So basically, what's going on is this first argument node here is the thing you're trying to look up. So it is the string like www.cs.ucsd.edu. So when you pass that string into here, that is going to look up that particular name in the DNS system. Now, as we talked about a few minutes ago, um, there's a lot of different resource records in DNS. There's the, the one, the A record, that maps to an IP address. There's a, a record that maps to a mail server. Uh, there's one that maps to the name server, et cetera. And so we have to um, sort of tell it what we're trying to do, what we're actually trying to look up. And that is sort of what this second argument here is for. So the service tells you what, um, basically what, what service I'm actually going to uh, connect to once I do that lookup. Today when we talk about um, TCP, we're going to talk about different ports. And so that service corresponds to a TCP port. So if we're creating a web client, we would want to put indicate through that second argument that we're connecting to the web port. And if we wanted to connect to the SSH port, like if we're writing an SSH client, we would want to indicate that that's the SSH service. Finally, there is a, um, a third argument, which is called hints, which allows us to basically give some customization to the lookup that we want to do. So we talked about how there's this, you know, the internet protocol has these two different versions. There's the IPv4, there's IPv6, they have different formats. And so we can actually specify, for example, we just want to look up the address using one of those internet versions or the other. Um, and then the result is actually returned to us in this last argument, which is an in-out argument. Now, 
the thing that's kind of interesting about this um, last argument, so the result type of this DNS lookup, is that it actually returns back a data structure that's suitable for creating one of these um, sockets that we're going to be talking about. So, depending, so if you had an IP address and you wanted to um, uh, connect, if you wanted to create a socket connection to that service in order to start um, executing a protocol exchange, there are a set of API calls described in the book that will allow you to sort of set up the address in a way that the sockets layer can understand. What's useful about this command here is that it will actually do that setup for you. So basically, it will return back a data structure suitable that you can just pass it into these sockets calls, and um, it'll make a connection directly to that service. Okay. So in order to kind of um, uh, 